Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Biggest Little Farm. Uh, my name is Will Lee. I'm the uh, head of digital entertainment for Meredith Corp, which is, comprises the People and Entertainment Weekly brands. Uh, but more importantly, um, I went to Apri Apricot Lane Farms, uh, I believe it was about 2012 or 2013, and I, before, w really when, when uh, John and Molly started um, their incredible adventure, and um, it, I have had the avocados, I have had the eggs, <laughs> and you must have them sometime before, uh, before too long, because they are ac absolutely amazing, and, and many of the other things there. But it's really such a beautiful place, and you know, if you're ever in Moore Park, you should definitely look at it, uh, go check it out. Um, but you know, to, for in the interest of time, I could, I could go on forever, but um, I want to introduce uh, a, a great filmmaker, uh, obviously a very great farmer, um, and more importantly, a force for good and a friend, John Chester. Thank you, that was nice. I was like hearing my own eulogy or something. That was pretty cool. <laughs> well, you're, uh, uh, it's, you know, I, I, this is now the second time I've seen the movie, and um, I still, you know, knowing what you went through and knowing what uh, that farm looked like uh, early, it still is v fills me with a great deal of emotion, actually, to see you here now and see this work and see what has become of the farm. So, but really, I think the question that we're all asking uh, ourselves right now is, when do you sleep, John? Um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know how to answer that question seriously. Um, it's been a, it's been a rough couple of years. I feel, I feel like it's, it's definitely aged me mm -hmm. the whole process, but it's, it's been such a, um, it's been such a, an experience of beyond purpose and meaning. It's, it's sort of reconnected me to this, just understanding really the impermanence of life, which has made me appreciate life so much more. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't trade the sleepless feelings I have right now for anything. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, you are a filmmaker and a farmer. Do you consider yourself a filmmaker farmer or a farmer filmmaker? Do you have a? Is 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 this? I, I'm just curious. When you started this journey, the storytelling, like how did that inform the farming and and vice versa? Well, it's cool. I remember somebody saying to me that. Um, I can't, you know, you're going to be so bored on a farm. And I've got to tell you, I, it's, it's so much more about, yeah, right? And that was only 90 minutes of the 90 terabytes of footage that we captured. My editor still talks to me, believe it or not. <laughs> um, the editing process was only a year and a half. Um, but I, I think that's what's so cool about it. You, you trade a geographical experience of being able to travel and, like, go to dinner somewhere for one of great depth on the land that you're, you know, you're farming. And um, I, you're using the same brain of like observation and then hacking into the opportunity, you know, like it's, it's very much like documentary filmmaking where you have an idea of what you think you're going to do and then nature sort of tells you you're going to do it this way. And then you have to accept that and the, the faster you accept it and that whole process of humility, um, I find I find it to be really challenging creatively, you know. Um, so I don't know really which I am. I don't think I'm either, really. Well, you're both, and right. and, and, and 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 incredibly great at both. Uh, we, we should all be, uh, you know, as good oh. at one thing as you are at both. But I, I think one well of the well, I did edit the film so with with an editor. Yeah, so. <laughs> and wrote it. And I mean, it's no. It's I'm just really saying, I made yeah. myself a little bit. <laughs> Um, I mean, remarkably, so one of the things that I find really interesting about this, about this film is that, is that effectively you and Molly and the farm um, are the subject. In other words, you know, documentary filmmaker, you will go and you, you know what the subject is. You might not know what the outcome might be, right? Or, and if you look at certain documentaries like, you know, Free Solo or, or Knocked on the House, like, you, you know, very unclear what, what story you are going to be able to tell. Um, well how did you how did you approach that early on when you you know I'm because this is again you as you say 90 minutes of 90 terabytes you know this is also 90 minutes of you know 10 ye you know or eight years yeah, and I didn't and I didn't know that I wanted to, I, I never admitted that I was gonna make the film um, I just had that thing you know as a documentary experience where it's like regret is more painful than the time wasted in other words I'd rather sorry I'd, I'd 
regret, I would rather regret um, having wasted time versus, I don't know where I went with that. <laughs> I just woke up. No, but I, but I, I, I took it, if I saw something, I shot it. And, and I, I would just worry about it later. And I, I wouldn't get consumed with where it was going or what it was about. And any, anyone that ever asked, are you gonna make a film about this? No, I mean, legitimately, I sold all the cameras that I had and I, a lot of it started on a 5D and I was shooting on an iPhone. And then eventually I got like an F55 and then in a mirror once I got serious. But it was around year five that I realized what I had been shooting, all these little things, we're actually tying together as solutions to the problems we had been facing. And the fear was dissipating. And the reason the fear about farming was dissipating because I was starting to see how these rhythms happen and these cycles would occur and then you would sort of solve them by triangulating in on them. You wouldn't solve one problem with one solution. You would find like three small solutions and it would kind of balance it out. And I, and I realized once I was, I was like, wow, I've been capturing this. So around year five, I had this like overwhelming like of just a flood of like seeing the whole film and being told in a different way. And I never wanted to make a film that was gonna scare people into caring about stuff because I don't believe that works. Not well. <laughs> and, and, I, and so I wanted people to fall in love with it like I had and see the potential in that. You know, so um, year five is when I decided that we were gonna definitely do this and then we got really serious and all the holes that were missing in terms of sort of illustrating these certain characters in the film we spent a lot of time on. And then the rest of it was just happening, like while we were editing, the fires were happening and we were evacuating the barn and with the drives, you know, and three times, <laughs> you know, so all that stuff was kind of, we were inside the engine of the story and the, the engine of the ecosystem simultaneously. You, you just mentioned something that I think is one of the most important things about this film, which is that so much of the conversation, and you've said this before, you said this in some of your interviews, some, the, the conversation about climate change and, and you know, biodiversity and all of that, is often one uh, driven by fear, right? Yeah. And, and, and driven by sort of fear of, of what will happen if we don't somehow, um, you know, mitigate it. And I am wondering, like, you know, your film, I think will have, a, I, I hope, will have an incredibly great effect on, on what is, you know, how people view this. But what else, you know, how else can we, can we as sort of civilian non-farmers kind of, you know, help change the conversation to one about positivity and hope and optimism um, because it's, 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 it is admittedly very, very challenging. Well, I don't know. I, I wasn't taught to look at nature that way. You know, I, I don't think any of us really were. I don't think we were taught to see that and respect the 4.5 billion year head start that it had on us. And around 75 years ago, you know, um, we began to find the miracles of chemical farming and we put nature in a straitjacket and caused collateral damage. And now we're at a point where like, well, maybe you know, maybe there's, maybe there's a problem with that. I, I hate when people say that humans are cancer to the earth, you know, because I think that's like almost in a way like it lets us off the hook because cancer isn't conscious of its, of its demise, its imminent demise because it's sucking nutrients from its host, but it doesn't have the awareness for that. And I find that if humans are in fact doing this much damage in the way that we have not been conscious, then when we're conscious we can we can do great things in a shorter period of time. That 45 years to get that farm to look in that way, like it, it was extracted for 45 years, but consciously we reversed it in seven and got it, left it better than when, when, when it was probably what it looked like 45 years ago. I, I just think it's incredibly hopeful to me. I actually, I have, have, I have more hope after this experience than less, you know, I think. Um, so speaking of hope, can you tell us a little bit about uh, sort of what, what is happening on the farm today and, and, and how, how things are, because obviously a, a complete, very dynamic range of... Well, it's pretty current. Um, yeah, it was right up until like last, uh, this, pa this went past winter. Yeah. Um, uh, Emma weighs 650 pounds, so she hasn't, she let herself go after the film. <laughs> um, and uh, we've, you know, it's fruit season, so it's busy, it's a really busy time. But Molly and I are getting a little bit more... Um, you know, comfortable with, with, we have a really great crew right now, which is enabling me to do this. <laughs> um, and there, a lot of them were interns. Uh, you saw a lot of them. They were volunteers in the film, and they're now full-time employees. Um, and how many staff do you have now? So farm, agricultural staff, it's 20. But then once we did the nutrient analysis on some of the food, our, and we showed that to our investors, 
Um, we saw a three to five time increase in nutrient analysis of our eggs over five years. And the only thing that changed, same food. What, was, what do you think the only thing was that changed over those five years? The soil, the grass they were eating, the bugs they were eating. They were being packed with more nutrients and therefore that was being transferred to the eggs. And once we saw that, we saw that in some other things that we were testing, we realized we were, we were onto something and we were selling, we're selling out every year. But now the thing was we've had to have this whole reinvestment now we're just keeping us <laughs> away from the black and into the <laughs> still in the red. Um, but we're having to start, you know, market teams and, um, you know, direct to consumer because we get three times as much by selling direct to consumer. So it, it's cool. I mean, we prove a concept after about four to five years and um, we're very fortunate to have an investor that just really believes in this, you know. Yeah, that's great. Um, one more question and we'll open it up to the audience. So um, more yes. than 20 now, now it's like, you know, 30, 40, depending on season and stuff like that. It it's could amazing. be more when during the, when there's pickers, there's 35 guys that come out, but. Fl Flavio is still with you. Yes. I Flavio think. is still there. <laughs> yes. It's amazing. Um, it, you know, obviously the, uh, towards the end of the movie, your, your, your son's birth and the evolution of the farm are very, very elegantly paralleled. And, and I wonder, can you talk a little bit about how, you know, how Bodhi has sort of helped you know, helped you or, or has changed your perspective on sort of the growth of the, uh, the farm and, and what is happening there? That's funny. I, um, I look at like, I, I at least know that whatever happens, he's going to look back and be like, all right, you tried, you know. <laughs> and this past year, you know, we use, um, we use 10 to 35 percent below our water allocation every year and we grow cover crop which is pretty cool, especially in California, which ships like 80% of its food out of Ventura. Um, the Ventura area, the, wa the water is all from an aquifer, right, which is recharged by rainwater, which we don't get a lot of, except this past year, we got like 24 inches. But with because of the um, cover crop this past year, we were able to sequester over 140 million gallons of water, which is pretty incredible. And I'm really proud of that because I look at him and I'm like, I know that that water is going to one day seep back down to that aquifer, depending on its the permeability of the geological ge geological formations beneath, and then that will that'll, that'll be there for him. So I, I look at everything I'm doing much differently through his eyes, and I like that he walks around and he understands the purpose of the pepper tree and the purpose of this and the purpose of that, and th and I like that he takes branches down and doesn't even bother to pick food; he just eats off of it like Willy Wonka in the chocolate <laughs> factory. I'm like, you are living in the Truman Show. One day I'm going to have to show you the rest of the world. <laughs> it is amazing to let watch. Um, any questions um, from the audience? My question is, have any of your neighbor farms tried to follow in your footsteps and put down cover crops and yes. at least work in, in, in the same kind of direction? Yeah, but they don't tell me. They just, I just see them appear. I have noticed cover crops appearing this year, which is great because they've stopped using Roundup. I mean, they just gave another guy $2 billion for his, uh, his lymphoma. I mean, did you hear about that, the third case to settle for uh, Roundup? It's unbelievable. And that, th so what's going to happen is you're going to see Roundup stop being used in parks. I guess they're just going to pull weeds, so you're, everybody's going to have jobs, um, which is great. Uh, <laughs> um, we don't have it, but we haven't innovated around Roundup. That's the problem. We've kind of left that behind. Um, but yeah, I'm starting to see neighbors adapt some of these methods and and you know in the beginning there was a lot of like oh you're not going to feed the world with this way of farming um you know they thought we were going to point at them and call you know say that they were the problem and that's not that's not fair because we're all complicit in in the desire for cheap food and we've we've demanded that and they're responding to it um but they've come around and they're asking me why we don't have problems with thrips and how our acp numbers are down and um uh curious about how we've mitigated our snail problem and why do our trees look so good without, you know, using as much nitrogen as they use. So it's, it, there's, a, there's a little bit of a dialogue starting to happen. And that's really important. I hope the film doesn't polarize me and my neighbors because I have a lot of respect for, you know, what they're, what they're doing. And um, I think ultimately it's up to us to vote with our dollars and support s small farms. And trust me, their children are dying to become regenerative farmers because it's way more fun. What gave you the confidence? How do, b before you did this, and you were living in an, a small apartment in Santa Monica, what background did you bring to this? What made you think that this was something that you could do? I'm not so sure I should overanalyze that. 
I, it might be, I, I don't know, there's something, um, well, I did spend, in my 20s, I spent a few years on a farm, my uncle's farm, but it was, I drove a tractor and used a weed whacker and I built fences for him. I didn't know anything about soil. Um, I don't know, I think we, we were going, I don't know, it was 2009 and the, the, the market fell out of the bo bottom, fell out of the market, and no one was investing in documentary filmmakers anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so it seemed like really romantic to think that we could do this, and we were really only gonna do it on 10 acres, which would have been enough, <laughs> would have been plenty. And we didn't need to grow 250 things, which is what we do, which is too much. You can do this, you can grow three or four things, you know, and you can do it on two acres or an acre, you can do it on a quarter acre, I mean, maybe not sustainably economically, but, um, yeah, I don't know, my, my wife and I are both like, um, I, I drink a little bit of the same nectar that she drinks She's a hummingbird, so she like drinks this stuff and she just goes off. Yeah, wish and, I could. And then, I, I, if I may editorialize, um, you you should all go watch um, a documentary called The Rock Prophecies, which um, John uh, wrote and directed yeah. and and produced. It's it's a uh, completely different kind of sh uh, movie. Uh, but what I would say about The Rock Prophecies is that there's a certain spirit of intrepidness um, to the way it's made and to the story it tells, and I think that. It has, a, you know, seep has clearly informed uh, both the farm and this particular film. That's that's the film that made me quit the film business too. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, but it's still worth watching. Um, Thank you. That's very nice. Anybody else? Yes. Have you started creating any programs for education of people who are interested in regenerative farming? Are you doing anything where you're offering your model to be to be copied in other parts of the country, Absolutely. et cetera? Yeah. The best thing we're doing is, is we run a, something, we basically are a wolf farm. So we uh, bring uh, wolf volunteers from all over the world. And so that's how we built the farm. Like the first year it was me, Raul, Molly, and uh, about seven or eight, up to nine wolfers for the first two, almost three years and then we started hiring full-time <laughs> actually hiring them and so we've run almost 200 woofers through the program um, like I said we've hired a bunch of them uh, many of them have gone off to run their own farms and some have said all right I'm not gonna do farming that's terrible um, so that's the best really the best thing we can do is to give them the experience you know of experimenting on our you know letting us make the mistakes on our dime and anybody that's interested in farming, I would say that's, you know, people say, how do you d just get started? I wish I had volunteered on more farms. Mm. I, I aged myself in f sheer panic and fear of not knowing a lot of the, n I wasn't able to normalize a lot of the um, things I was dealing with. It all felt like it was the end of the world. You know, and I think you need to experience with other farmers um, where that level of panic is and humility and the whole thing about embarrassment, man, I tell you, that's the thing I learned the most is that we overcorrected things too quickly to mask the embarrassment and the anger and frustration that came from that versus the time that you really need to spend in letting the bad thing just take its course for a bit, step back and figure it out. You know, and that's a little bit of what happened with the coyote. I mean, it's, you think about it, I mean, I wasn't very popular for letting 350 chickens die before I killed one coyote. But once I killed one coyote, I knew I was gonna have to kill 13. I knew that, but I couldn't convince anyone else that that was worse than letting 350 chickens die. It's a lesser of two evils things constantly. There's no right and wrong. It's all based on consequences, like the ecosystem, you know? But yeah, the training program, is the wolf program is how we do that. And, and this film, and I'm, you know, we'll continue to bring wolfers on the farm. We have time for one more? One more. That you kind of trusted him, and there you are in this dirt. I didn't trust dusty Alan. Place yeah, <laughs> Molly trusted Alan. I, I thought that was amazing. Yeah, she Molly knew Molly found the Demeter um, or a certification called uh, by it was Biodynamics is the certification, which we don't even talk about in the film, because I mean it's one of our certifications, and I believe in some of the elements of, of Biodynamics. I don't know if I can say all of it works. Um, but we needed to communicate to our consumer because we weren't telling our story. You know, we needed to con communicate to our consumer that we had some, you know, ethical, moral compasses on how we were going to do things. So she went to this organization called Demeter, which runs biodynamic, the biodynamic certification. And they, um, they told her about a few and she found Alan in searching on the internet with him. Yeah. And it was like classic. And it's not in the movie, but 
she called him and he's like, you don't want anything to do with this. You sound like a sweet, you know, person. But <laughs> and she's like, no, no, it's a it's a rundown conventional lemon farm. And he's like, yeah, you don't your investor's not ready for this kind of. And then she called him back again and she's like, you don't understand. You're the only person that is even can do what we're thinking. And, and, and he's like, all right, well, I'll come down and I'll meet you. And he w came down to the house and he had um, brought a case of wine and Molly didn't see it. And he had it at, the s at his feet and he says, you like wine? And Molly goes, no, Mo John and I actually don't drink wine. And he goes, oh, that was the beginning of our relationship. <laughs> well, thank you very much, all of you, for, for being here. Thanks for coming out. Um, John, thank you so much for this yeah. amazing work. Tell your, f tell your friends. Yeah. Thank you all. Thanks very much.